So I wanted to talk a little bit about English colonization after 1660. And it's not exactly chapter 5, I don't think, in your textbook. But um, I was trying to give you a little bit of heads up on what's going on in the, in the English colonies at this point. Um, Charles II was restored to the throne in England, and he was all about colonial expansion. Um, they had the Royal African Company, and this Royal African Company was given a monopoly of the slave trade. All they did was trade in slaves. So they ran a, uh, they ran, um, a route from Europe to Africa, Africa to the Caribbean, and the Caribbean back to England. Um, and so it was a triangle. They called it the triangular trade, and that's what it was. So within a generation, so 25 years or so of this, the number of English colonies in North America had doubled. You had New Netherland that um, England gained in the, the war with the Netherlands um, in 1664. And, um, and so um, Charles gave his brother James the, the, the colony uh, of New Netherland, which was, became New York, of course. They had tried to, the Dutch had been trying to maintain holdings all over the world. And um, so they gave up on New Netherland quick, quick, quick. Um, they turned it from a military outpost into um, an important English, tra a trading port with the Caribbean. And so they um, were going to also use it so they could... Um, have fights with French in the north. If you look in 1664, there were 9,000 inhabitants. By 1685, there were 20,000. To say that the growth was astronomical is probably an understatement. The Iroquois nation um, was strengthened as a result of the English rule. Sir Edmund Andros, who was in New York, had all kinds of negotiations in the 1670s and came up with this covenant chain so that the English and the Indians helped each other out against the French. And so the um, five Iroquois nations um, helped uh, the British attack the French and then the French Indian allies. The um, English give um, authority to the Indian over authority in the area of the Ohio River. Uh, and so the Indians and the British and the French are all um, dealing with each other. And you have all sorts of alliances that come up as a result. If you go ahead a little bit to 1754, we get to the French and Indian War. And so that has to do with all of these different uh, group dynamics going on. You have New York's Charter of Liberties and Privileges, and that um, they set up, it sets up an, an elected assembly because people were complaining that their rights were being denied, and they had elections every three years, and if you were a property owner, a male property owner, or a free man, you could uh, vote in these elections, and so it was reaffirmed. It reaffirmed the traditional English rights, trial by jury, security, property, religious toleration for Protestants. Notice not all people, just the Protestants. But also, if we go back to 1607 in Jamestown, you have to realize how these people were thinking, because to come up with an idea that, that um, the Na the Americans are going to say uh, in 1776, they're going to say, uh, we don't like taxation without representation. You have to go back to 1607 and understand that the charter for Virginia originally in 1607 said that people living abroad in the colonies or colony would have the same rights as the Englishmen living at home. Well, if that's the case, then the people in the colonies deserve to have representatives in Parliament. So if they don't, then that's against their English rights. 
So the, the, the extension of that is that the other colonies, it was an assumed deal that they were going to have the same um, rights as Englishmen. It was a given that the Virginians had it, and so all the other colonies would as well. So that was a, an assumed thing. Also, you have to realize the virtual representation was um, a concept, an English concept, and what that meant was that if if I'm elected to represent people in England, I represent everybody. I don't just represent my district, my town, my county. I represent everybody. So for the English, representation was not that big a deal. For the colonists, they didn't see that there was a problem because everybody represented, everybody was represented in Parliament. The fact that the, the representatives were none of them were from the colonies didn't really matter to the English so much. It mattered a great deal to the colonists, of course. But virtual representation is something that is not um, talked about a great deal. So that was an aside, and it will we'll remember that when we get to the Revolution. There was not, there were no new colonies um, from in 30 years until Charles came into onto the scene in the late 1600s. Um, he wanted there to be, they wanted. They founded Carolina in order to prevent Spain from encroaching on Virginia, which was a heavily, um, um, it was a huge colony for the tobacco, of course, and so that was very valuable for the English. And so they didn't want this, they didn't want the Spaniards coming from Spanish Florida up into Virginia here. So they said, oh, we'll put Carolina. Carolina was originally just one colony in 1670. North Carolina and South Carolina, their interests were very different. Um, Carolina, North Carolina was much into tobacco. This part of Carolina was very into large plantations and indigo and rice and those sorts of things. So they split in 1712. Um, by 1733, um, the king was concerned still about Spanish Florida, and so because now South Carolina was a huge um, rice and indigo state, and so they wanted to protect Charleston, and so they created Savannah, well, Georgia with Savannah, to protect as the buffer colony against the Spaniards as well. So these, these Carolina. Uh, settlers came from Barbados. What was going on was that the planters, the large planters there, their sons were, um, their sons were running, they were running out of land, and so their sons had nothing to do. So they went to the king and said, why don't we have a colony? And, the, and it just so happened that the king wanted a buffer colony, basically, for Virginia, and so to protect against the Spaniards. So the Barbadians came, and they established these huge plantations. They brought their enslaved populations with them, and the Barbados Slave Code was one of the most restrictive, um, most oppressive slave codes around, and so they brought that with them to South Carolina, or to Carolina, and then that's what took, took root there. William Penn wanted to, had um, his dad was owed some money by the king. Well, his dad died, so the king now owed William Penn. So William Penn was very much into Quaker principles and those sorts of things. So he um, said, "Okay, you give me some land in the New World, and I'll set up a colony." So that, and then our debts paid off. Well, the king was giving away free land because, you know, he didn't have to come up with any money for it, so he just was giving away free land, so that was a perfect thing for him. And um, it was great for William Penn because he was very devout and he wanted to set up a colony, so it all worked um, for everybody. So he comes and sets up uh, uh, this colony for basically Quakers, but he wants equality for everyone and um, he, he emphasized the um, 
freedom was for everybody and the individual con conscience and they came and uh, were not slaveholders they didn't want slaves and they were it was a very um, open sort of society they didn't believe in violence and so they didn't have guns well if that's the case and you don't have any guns and you're living in Indian territory in the wilderness you probably need to have a good relationship with the Indians so that they don't come and you know kill you in the middle of the night so they actually were very respectful of the Indians at the beginning anyway and uh, so they did not have guns there and they didn't have weapons so they didn't believe in those in violence and this is more about they didn't organize a militia until 1740s and they were forced to to some degree to participate in the American Revolution they were not very uh, much into it at the beginning however by this point the um, colonists are their original principles are not quite as um, strong as they were during William Penn's time um, they pro prohibited swearing no drunkenness no adultery and um, this virtuous citizenship was a big deal they had local um, they had all males were el eligible to vote most males were eligible to vote and so he sold the land to people at low prices which makes the makes it easier for immigrants to um, to buy land there so he was actually seems like a very good person there was no established church in Pennsylvania whereas in all the other colonies you had the Anglican Church as the established church it was basically the government church because they were British colonies and the Anglican Church was the Church of England was the government um, church with the king as the head um, Jews could live in Pennsylvania but they could not hold office so they were things were pretty good in Pennsylvania um, they had less indentured servants and the indentured servants that were in Virginia and Maryland um, wanted to go to Pennsylvania so indentured servitude begins to um, drop off in the early 1700s and by 1750 uh, indentured servitude is basically gone and it's free people and slaves so what's important is that there was no European country that colonized in the Americas with the intent of relying on African slaves they did not come here saying oh we'll use slaves to um, cultivate our land they did not come here with that so while it's not right they did not it was not an intentional thing it developed as a matter of course unfortunately indentured servants didn't have any protection under um, but the slaves didn't have any protection under English common law they didn't ever get free their children were always slaves um, and so they had been exposed to European diseases so they they were immune for the most part okay so we'll stop there for now and um, we will come back and talk about um, some other issues in the early colonial days um, after a little while. Thanks.